Well, the next force I'm going to look at is the magnet force. And the magnet force requires you to set up some geometry. Specifically, it needs one or more metaballs merged together. So I'm going to lay down a metaball at the center of my scene, and I'm going to increase its radius a little bit, like so. And that's our metaball geometry. And it's often easier to set up a magnet force using the shelf tool, which is here on the drive simulation tab. So with nothing selected, I select magnet force. And it tells me to select the dynamic objects that are going to be affected by the magnet force. So let's select everything. And press enter. And then I need to select the object for the magnet force. Now the object has to be a metaball. So I select my metaball and press enter. And inside our dot network, what we've got is a SOP geo node. And the SOP geo node is pointing to our metaball geometry. And what a SOP geo node does is bring geometry into an auto dop or a dop context. So this is bringing in our metaball and attaching it as some sub data to our magnet force. We can have a look at that here. So let's have a look at any of these boxes, the forces, we've got a magnet force, and then we can see we've got geometry, and it's a metaball, so it only has a single point, but that, believe me, is the metaball geometry. So what does it do? Well, it allows you to attract or repel geometry from your metaball, and I'm going to just turn off the display of my guide geometry and I'm also going to turn off display of the metaball itself so that we can see things a bit easier and let's go back into our auto dot network so my metaball is located at the center I've given it a force of 100 and we can see that's attracting in some of the objects into the center of our frame, which is where the metaball is. And likewise, we can give it a negative scale to repel the objects from the metaball's location, like so. Notice that the scale of the force declines according to the shape and the kernel function of your metaball. And it therefore doesn't affect all of the objects here because at the edge here the metaball's field or density is zero so you're not having any effect from the magnet force. It's a little hard to tell which objects are going to be affected. If we show the guide geometry it's not just the objects that are inside this ball that are affected. Some of the ones on the edge of the ball here are not really affected. We can also animate our metaball, and I'm going to do that. Let me first of all reduce the size of this, the scale of the force. And I happen to have a path set up here, and I'm going to animate the metaball along this path. So here's my metaball, and down here we can use as a path object a curve. At frame 1 I can give it a position of naught. So I alt left click here to give it a position of naught. I turn off simulation, move to frame 100 and give it a position of 1. And that should mean, if we visualize our metaball, that it moves along this curve. So if I re-enable simulation, once more I need to go into my auto dot network, and on my SOP geo node I need to set always for the SOP path and set always for the time, which is already set to dollar $t. And what we should find is that our metaball will move along our path as time goes on. And let me just turn off the display of guide geometry again. And 
and turn off display of the metaball itself and we can see the effect which is that it pushes items out of the way as it moves along that curve like so Now let's try one further trick with the magnet force. And as you can see, I've created a ground plane and I've also added some gravity to our simulation. And what I'm going to do is link the position of our magnet force to the position of an object which is actually being simulated within the simulation. And that object that's going to be simulated is going to be this sphere. And for reasons that we'll come on to in a moment, I'm going to leave this at the origin and then I'm going to make it an RBD object. And then if I dive into my Autodot network and go into the object that's been created, the RBD object here, we can see that amongst the parameters on the initial state tab is a position parameter. So this is an alternative way to position your objects in an RBD simulation. So I'm going to use this to position my sphere. I'm also going to give it some velocity. I'm going to give it a velocity of minus 5 in the x direction and some angular velocity of 60 around the z axis. So if I press play, we can see, and the, you can see that the magnet force is still operating there, we can see that it falls down. What I want to do is link the magnet force's position to the position of the sphere as it's simulated. And if we have a look at our SOP Geo node here, we can see that there's something called the position data path. This means that if we've got some data attached to our magnet force, which is called position, then that will be used as the position of our force. And we've switched off use object transform, so it's just going to use this position. And in fact, I can use a node called fetch data. I link this in to our magnet force. And fetch data allows me to fetch some data from another object in the scene and attach it here. So I'm going to fetch data from sphere object 2. So let's control C, control V. The data I'm going to fetch is called position, and I want to call it position when it's attached to this uh, magnet force here. And this should mean that our sphere is going to give its position to this fetch data node and the fetch data node is going to attach it here and the SOP geo node is going to look for a position data and is going to move according to this position that we're fetching. So let's see that. And we can see that now the magnet force is rolling along with our sphere. Note that this only works for the magnet force because the magnet force accepts a SOP geo node. For other types of force, you would need to set their location using the dop option function, which I'm not going to go into here. Well, the final force I'm going to look at is probably the most flexible of all the forces, and that is the field force. And the field force accepts two types of input. You can either attach a vector field, that is something you've imported or created from, a, from three volumes, and use that as your force, or you can import a collection of points with attributes on them and use those as your force. Well, let's look first at the volume version. So let's lay down a geometry node. And I'm going to rename this force field. Dive inside, delete the file, and lay down a volume node. And we're going to make this into a vector volume. And I'm going to give it 
a y value of 1. And then let's increase the size of this so that it covers all of our objects. So that's our volume. We now need to import this into our SOP simulation. And I can do that using a SOP vector field because we've created a three valued volume. If we have a look here, we can see that we've created a vector. So that's producing three volumes. So we can import this using our SOP vector field node. It works very much like the SOP scalar field node. So I'm going to point this at the force field. And then I'm going to attach it to our field force here. And the field force allows me to scale this. So I'm going to give it a scale of 100. I'm also going to turn off display of our force field. And these force attribute parameters here don't have any effect when we're using a volume as the source of our force. And we can see that that produces a uniform upward force on our objects, as you'd expect. Well, now I want to look at the second form of the field force, which is where we use data attached to points to produce our force. So we need to set up some points with the relevant data attached. And I'm going to use this curve as the source for our force. And if we have a look at it, I'm going to turn off other objects. We can see that it's got quite a few points on it. That's because I've converted it into a polygon and increase the number of U divisions. So it's got plenty of points. I want to add a force which produces an attribute on each of these points which points along the tangent of the curve. So we're going to get a force which flows along this curve. And I can do that, fortunately, using the point SOP. So I'll lay one of those down. And we can see that one of the tabs on the point stop is the force tab and if we go down we've got something called edge force so I'm going to add edge force and I'm going to give it a value of 1 and if we have a look in our details view we can now see that there's an attribute here edge deer which is pointing along the edge in other words the tangent of our curve and we can confirm that by bringing this geometry into our auto.network. And we do that, as before, with a SOP geometry node. And I'm going to point this at our curve. And I'm going to attach this to our field force. And immediately we can see that we're getting some indicators of where our force is. That's because I've got show guide geometry on. And that's showing that we've got a force which is following the shape of the curve. And let's uh, just make sure this is reverted to defaults. I'm going to give it a value of 50, a multiplier of 50. And I've already set this. This force attribute parameter is by default force. And we, of course, need to set it to the attribute that we've actually got, which in this case is edge deer. And if I press play, we can see that our objects start to move along this curve. But only the objects which are quite close to the curve are being affected. And the reason for that is that one of the parameters of the field force is this use max distance. And when we're using a set of points here as the source of our force, uh, this use max, dis max distance determines which objects are affected. And only objects which are within this distance of a point will be affected by the force attached to that point. So if I was to increase this to, say, 10 we should now see many, many more objects. In fact, all of the objects in that scene are being affected by the force. 
So the field force is a very, very powerful force in DOPS because it allows you to construct with, great de with a great deal of control the shape of your force in space. Well, that brings me to the end of the survey of forces in DOPS. Some of you may have spotted that I've failed to cover a few of the forces. If we have a look here at the available nodes in forces, we've got buoyancy force and fluid force. These are used respectively for particle fluids and for voxel fluids to exert pressure from the liquid onto a rigid body object. There's a point force and the reference frame force, which are not that often used. There's a VOP force, which allows you to construct the bespoke force, which uh, you do using VOP nodes. And finally, probably most useful of all, there's the vortex force, which allows you to create whirlwind and vortex type effects. And the reason I'm leaving this out is that it's complicated enough to warrant a training video on its own, and I hope to cover it later on. So that brings me to the end of this survey of DOPS forces. I hope it's been useful.